we hadn't been called out until the last desperate minute because victorious had tried to have a go you know and, 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 and they were very brave and they did reconnaissance and they did an attack but it didn't have too much effect uh, Bismarck still steamed on well it was all finished in the end there was no hope of stopping Bismarck she was steaming 25 knots for breath well she was not far off so we were uh, yanked out of jib in the usual way <laughs> sent up north uh, then the, I took absolutely no air part, no flying part in the Bismarck because I was a Royal Marine. I had cipher uh, clearance. I was uh, on the flag deck where the Admiral would, would be prowling about. And, of course, I had access to all the cipher logs and so on. Or, or, or rather a strange quirk of circumstance. But our fullness, being fighters, and they were, were not employed. Aircraft carriers played an important part in the Bismarck chase. A new ship, the Victorious, launched an aircraft attack with torpedoes here. And later, the Ark Royal attacked with aircraft here and here. These attacks damaged the Bismarck and finally slowed her down enough for our heavy ships to get within range. But aircraft carriers have other uses. When the Bismarck was lost in mist, aircraft from the Victorious and Ark Royal searched hundreds of miles of the Atlantic Ocean. They shared this duty with aircraft from Coastal Command and the Royal Canadian Air Force, which operated from both shores of the Atlantic. The Bismarck was found and sunk as a result of this combined search. The signal came from the Admiral Dale, really from Churchill, was sink the Bismarck, and that was it. So, look, you can imagine, everybody tried, and uh, our main fleet, which was supposed to be hunting for it, was so far behind it, they couldn't catch it, and it was obviously heading, because of a lack of fuel by a previous hit or somewhere, by, you know, from one of the the ships that had been battling with Prince of Wales. The uh, thing was that uh, it had to get to Brest Harbour, you yes, see. Eh? I can remember that uh, we'd just come back from a club run, taking some aircraft, and we were tied up alongside the mole in Jib, and we were all to the sea, it was in, during the middle watch and uh, we left, that was the Art Royal, Renown, us and our destroyers, the F-class destroyers and we left Jib in a hurry and we went through into the Atlantic and during the forenoon the captain announced that the Bismarck uh, was uh, free in the far north of the Atlantic and we were do, actually going to cover a convoy of troops that were going down to South Africa. That was our first aim. You know, they thought that that's what they were after, what well, they were. And uh, for two days we steamed north and then the weather deteriorated and uh, it, it wasn't that the destroyers couldn't stick the rough weather but they were getting low on fuel and the Admiral some of them decided to send them back to Jib because the idea was that we were going to replenish them at sea but through the rough weather uh, that would have been possible so they were sent back to Jib and we carried on further north. Force H left Gibraltar. Force H consisted then of Renown, Sheffield, of course, Ark Royal, 
and four or five destroyers. And we left Jib suddenly um, and out into the Atlantic doing 25 knots in a big rising sea when we got round Cape St. Vincent on a northwesterly course. And then the buzz got round. The Bismarck had sunk the hood. We were amazed because the hood had been part of Force H when we first went to the Med. She, she was relieved by renown so that we knew the hood. And of course, everybody knew the hood as our kind of mightiest battleship in those days. And we were dumbstruck with the thought that the hood had been sunk by the Bismarck. Then, of course, they lost her. And we steamed on at 25 knots into a very heavy sea. We lost all our destroyers. They couldn't keep up with us. And even the Renown started to um, peel back one of her torpedo blisters up forward. But anyway, we forced on right through that night and the next day. And then the following night, we got in the area that they suspected the Prince Eugen and Bismarck would be. Of course, the hood, I think the hood was entirely the fault of, of their lordships. She was a, a light battleship, battle cruiser, flimsily armoured, but they seemed to have learned no lessons from the Battle of Jutland, which, of course, was an ignominious defeat of British technology in ships, where they blew up one after another. And the Germans virtually survived. I know a lot of some of them did sink, but not, not in any comparable rate. And you'd have thought that all this tremendous keenness about gunnery officers being the only way for promotion in the Navy institutes some sort of insulated layer of intelligence between common sense. And, and they didn't seem to have either when it came to uh, the, the reorganization of their battleships uh, against these businesses. And with one salvo, what it happens, she just blows up her magazine, blow up. It's not as though it was... It wasn't just the hood, it was also the Barham in, in, in the Mediterranean had a similar uh, disastrous thing. The whole ship blew apart in a minute and a half. And when, in due course, Tovey made that CNC home fleet in the Bismarck action signal that he was unable to sink Bismarck by gunfire, it rings a bit hollow in my ears that, that here we had uh, the hood blow up in in within seven minutes of engagement, and then we had the bar and blow up with one lucky torpedo that blew up in even 30 seconds. And uh, so we can sink a British ship in 30 seconds, but we can't sink the Bismarck with the whole arrangements of battleships and everything pounding their shells in. If something was wrong, and, and, and that, is, that is what disturbed me so much. At the beginning of the Bismarck business, when the hood blew up, well, uh, also other arguments that all that eagerness of being Nelson and getting into the kill. And he steered straight for Bismarck, which meant only his A and V turrets, the forward turrets, could bear. If he'd done on a sort of a gradually converging course, reducing the range, he could have had his X and Y turrets. That's if he'd double the amount of guns firing. But anyway, the way he did. And he also had, uh, I think, uh, Prince of Wales um, in tow, uh, who was just early learning how to work its guns, and they were all stationed in such close order, I think they had 400 yards between two cables, between ships and something, whereas you'd have thought that if there's going to be any overs or misses of ship A, if you've got another one within the vicinity, the chances are it's going to hit ship B, which is actually what happened. Uh, at least sort of errors in, in, in comprehension and that's not my side of the business. Mine is the air business. But this is gunnery. And you'd have thought any common sense dispersal. God's truth, we learned about dispersing our aircraft. What did they disperse their ships? 
in an attack formation, within reason anyway. So that, that pretty upset us. I mean, everybody was shocked by the loss of the hood. But as a result, of course, the Navy went into absolute panic because Hood's sister ship was renowned. Renown was our, our beloved Admiral Somerville, who had more sense than any of these other admirals. Uh, and he, was set, he, he received a signal. So under no circumstance was he to ha attempt to engage Bismarck. Under no circumstances. What a signal to send. What a, an admission of total failure by the gunnery world that they had to deny even a captain, proud captain of a ship to engage the enemy. It runs contrary to all the spirits that we know. However, they were so terrified that this awful display with Jutland in the background and Hood then coming to the front. To have a third one would have been just too much. So Renan was ordered under no circumstances to engage the Bismarck. Things happened. We heard the next thing we heard that the hood had been sunk, which was unbelievable. But uh, it it happened. And then uh, the next we heard that uh, the Suffolk and the Norfolk were shadowing her, and that the Victorious was uh, flying off aircraft. And then we, the next thing we heard was that they'd lost her, and uh, it turned out that we were then the only ones that could cover from coming down to the south and we were ordered more or less to the Bay of Biscay area to, to cover that route. And then the next thing we knew was that an aircraft, I think it was a Catalina, had spotted her and uh, things at one time were very tight because they just didn't know where she was and everybody was getting a bit worried and uh, uh, as I said they found, found her and it was then hoped that we would be the ones who would do the necessary and I, I believe Admiral Somerville threw three caps over the side asked in the Admiral to, that he should take you know the idea was the aircraft and the renown one side and us the other but uh, we were told that we were to refrain from that and just try and cut off her route and at dawn we flew off in a big search of swordfish to find her but of course a Catalina found her and we were recalled but uh, one of or two of our swordfish were vectored on to where the hood was, where the uh, Bismarck was, and shadowed her. In the meantime, another swordfish with a long-range tank was prepared and flown off to take over the shadowing because the Catalina had to go back to Loch Ern. It would have run out of fuel. Most of the, the, the shore patrols were the two and a half hours. But you could get, they do it four and a half hours. Now, four and a half hours, what happened was that the air gunner, this usually only happened when you were in mid Atlantic, and then you out would come the air gunner, and in would go another tank behind the pilot. And of course, the, the, the navigator would be shoved next to where the air gunner would, would be sitting, you know. When he, he'd have to take over the wireless and whatnot, you see. But the extra tank, he could get four and a half hours out of it, you see. So that extended your flying time quite a lot. But have you any idea what it is to go four hours in mid Atlantic in, in, in an open cockpit? Not funny, not funny, I can tell you. They used to have to lift you out to get, when you got back. You, could, you, know, you were frozen stiff nearly. Yeah. Anyway, there we are. We had to do these things. Really. Nobody ever realised how bad the weather was then. So you can imagine getting away from the ship in a 4-6, 4-7 gale. Oh, you know, you know, when you which way the 
the wind was going to turn next, and that, you know, and he had to get back to that ship. We did that, that for two days, I remember, but we didn't pick up anything until we heard that this Catalina had picked up something. We got, we intercepted that, and it happened to be that just one of the air, uh, swordfish, it was able to go right to that spot and, and hang on to that Bismarck, you see. And uh, it was there until it was relieved, you see. And this is, we were on a shuttle back and forth to, to, make, to hang on to that uh, Bismarck. One thing you hadn't, you simply must not do, is to lose touch or, or to um, miss any alterations. So you had to keep it under the, the, the enemy target under continuous observation the whole time. Watch out for any alterations, of course. She was slightly down by the head, but it was a most magnificent ship. And the other thing, of course, was worrying me in case they decided to launch their Arado seaplane, which, of course, was vastly superior in performance to a swordfish with many higher caliber guns. I think that the difficulty was that um, you had to do an awful lot, particularly if, if you were without a, a radio man of, uh, to, to work the radio, as, as with a long-range tank. Uh, you know, had to coat up, keep the navigational plot going, draft your signals. I mean, you didn't just write them out in plain language. You had to use a self-evident code, uh, which had very little security, but you use... For any amplifying reports, you had a, a, a numbers, which was sort of what the enemy was doing. You put 439 for enemies forming line ahead or something like that. And then you were supposed, after your initial reports, to, to code it up in t with a, what was known as a psycho box, which was a tin box about the size of a child's paint box with a, a card of jumbled figures and letters and a cursor on top. So you move the cursor with the actual language you wanted to send, and then read it off what the jumbled letters were, were below, and then um, send that out by radio. And it took an awful lot of time. And if you dropped anything on the deck of the cockpit, it was a major physical operation to retrieve it. <laughs> And, you, of course, you had continually to watch the surface of the sea for signs of the wind changing. And uh, if the wind did change, you had an elaborate maneuver that you did find the wind again and then plot allow so much back for the change of wind. So you had very little assistance except for a, a beacon that you could tune in to or, and, and you got a a bearing from, just a, a straight bearing from the ship. We were f using long-range tanks, which meant that you, we sat in the uh, a gunner's cockpit with the long-range tank in our cockpit, and they were just strapped on the, literally on the top of the fuselage. So it, they pushed into our backs, and we were like that with the radio close up against our knees, there was a, a vent to the petrol tank pushing out nasty, smelly petrol fumes. <laughs> and we had to do our the usual observer's job and work the radio, the, this dreadful psycho-coding box, which in my case very quickly dropped to the deck and then worked its way miles out of reach. Um, however, the Initial sighting report is a very simple method of just saying from uh, so-and-so one BS, one battleship and its bearing, followed by confirmatory report of the battleship and its bearing and distance from you and your position. Well, that is fairly simple. And thank goodness, um, after that, if there was no change, you were allowed to get away with just making your call sign twice, about every 20 minutes. That signified, A, you were in touch with the enemy, um, and there was no change in the situation. <laughs>
So early codings or working out of new messages and things was obviated, thank goodness. Uh, the, w- the weather got worse and uh, the, it, it became force eight and force nine. You've no idea the, the, the seas that were mountainous and the uh, carrier was going up and down like a yo-yo. And I, that's what I say. What was that about that aeroplane? So, you see, no, to me, no other aircraft could have done what that uh, uh, sword did. To get off and get on. Uh, back on. A ship that was pitching like that. 60 feet it was pitching. I mean, it's uncanny. You think 60 feet? I mean, it, it's, it's unbelievable, really. But it's true. Yeah, that's an amazing airplane. Uh, that's why, uh, to me, you can't, I, I can't say enough about uh, the fairy surface. Well, I was briefed to be one of three aircraft to uh, carry out searches of sectors in the Atlantic for the Bismarck. We were in cloud, but we suddenly came out into a break and we were buffeted around the sky by a terrific amount of shrapnel and a large number of holes started to appear in our aircraft. I looked down and there we were in clear sky directly over the battleship. Uh, The fact that the ship was firing at us was uh, no proof that it was an enemy ship as the Royal Navy had instructions to fire on all aircraft approaching too close. Um, in my experience during the war, I was fired on uh, more often by the Royal Navy than by the Germans, uh, especially if the captain had, had a good lunch. And we, I told the pilot, the sub-lieutenant, um, to not to lose touch while I was working the radio, to keep the, the Bismarck in sight and to keep it a at the distance we were, which was probably about five or six miles. And fairly frequently we'd fly either across his stern or across his bows, and you'd look down your compass and the bearing, and that gave you his course. And he remained on the same course the whole time we were in the, in the air, which was nearly five and a half hours. And um, that's, we met the Aria flying boat, at fairly close quarters through a cloud that <laughs> sort of parted quickly and um, at one time I got my head out of the office you know, I'd been doing the radio and found n- nothing in sight at all and as you, once you made contact with the enemy the navigational technique was you plotted the enemy rather than yourself so if you wanted to know the position of the aircraft at any moment you, you got the plot of the battleship going 20 knots in a westerly course, and then if you were north of it, five miles, that was your position. It was met much better than trying to keep a, a, a track of your several alterations of course uh, through cloud and getting a better position from here. <laughs> and frequent alterations as you changed your viewpoint, so to speak. So I think our sub-lieutenant crab must have just lost sight in the very bad weather prevalent. Fortunately, we sighted the Sheffield. We didn't know that she'd um, separated from the rest of Force Age. And I came up on the lamp and said, uh, enemy bearing and distance, please. And they gave it back and so we recovered the the Bismarck. And about that time I could hear coming up on the radio through my earphones rather obscure signals from an aircraft in the air, which of course was the air striking force that went and attacked the Sheffield just after we'd left her. And I couldn't make out what this was. I must say, uh, I can't take my hat off more to these tremendous pilots and these shaggy old planes going through once again the same murky treatment the errors start repeating themselves, you see. The flagship uh, in, in Nelson, Nelson? Probably uh, uh, Failed 
to inform Force H, because Somerville knew his onions backwards and was certainly passed it to Ark Royal. Fair anyway, the message never got to Ark Royal. Uh, the signal was that there were no friendly ships within 30 miles, or was it 50 miles, of Bismarck. What had not been sent was that CMC Home Fleet had detailed Sheffield to shadow the Bismarck. Of course, Sheffield with, had got radar by that time, some sort of radar. Sheffield was within 20, 20 50 miles of Bismarck. We were then ordered to shadow the Bismarck after they found her and the Art Road sent some planes off uh, to locate her. The weather was very, very bad. Uh, in fact, at one time they didn't think that the Art Road could fly off any aircraft at all. During all this, uh, her flying off and taking on Air, aircraft, we were uh, sent to shadow the Bismarck, and through uh, a lot of signals, although the uh, renown had put up the signal, it, the Art Royal hadn't received it, or they received it too late. And we were sent off at uh, a rate of knots, and, and it, it is said that at one time we reached 38 knots, which was six knots above our estimated speed. Uh, all the paint on the funnels just peeled off. And then uh, about in, the, in one of the dog watches, I was standing uh, amidships at the boat deck talking to Abel Seaman Hancock. We were allowed to walk around. We, we weren't actually standing at the gun waiting to fire because there was not, I mean, unless it was aircraft, I mean, our guns would have, wouldn't have even reached her. And it was overcast and we saw these planes coming out of the clouds. And I said to Ben, I said, they're going to attack us. He said, oh, don't be so silly. Anyway, they did. The failure to tell the Ark Royal that Sheffield had been detailed to shadow the Bismarck resulted in very nearly another colossal tragedy because the two swordfish squadrons in very doubtful weather, the sea was enormous, it, the ship was pitching up and down. It was no mean thing to get 24, or was it 20, uh, uh, swordfish with a torpedo into the sky in formation. Well, the cloud base was about 500 feet, uh, uh, sleeting, wind, and, and the, uh, the whole thing was one of those grey, terribly anti-morale, uh, not a very cheerful sight uh, to go and do the job at all. Flying off about 60, 70 miles or so to the, where the Bismarck was reported to be, and so off they went, and staggering through cloud, they managed to maintain formation until breaking cloud, when they thought they were in the vicinity of the Bismarck, they see in the grey muck below a ship ploughing through the sea, throwing spray all over the place. So they immediately deploy and go into the attack and drop their torpedoes. As soon as we got back from our, our dawn search, we were refueled and rearmed and prepared for our first attack, which took off about three o'clock in the afternoon from Ark Royal. Fifteen aircraft led by um, Lieutenant Commander Stuart, um, Stuart Moore. 
and I was flying as number two to Godfrey Fawcett with Tony Beale on our left, the three of us in a Vic. And uh, off we went, 15 aircraft to attack the Bismarck. And we climbed up to about 8,000, 9,000 feet. And although it was blowing hard and there was a big sea running, the weather then was, the visibility was good. And there was a lot of broken cloud. And uh, we could see the target as we were being led in through gaps in the cloud and down we went in our dive and turned in to the attack. Now I had my doubts as we went down because I could see the ship and she wasn't firing at us. And I thought, well, that, that's odd, you know, previous attacks that I had done, the ship was firing at us in the dive. And as I leveled out on the water, I saw other aircraft dropping their torpedoes and I looked at the ship and I said, that is a town-class cruiser. I don't know which one, but it is a town-class cruiser and it had its battle white ensigns up. And so I didn't drop my torpedo. My leader did. He dropped his. But I held on to mine. And as I went past the ship, my air gunner was firing his Lewis gun, which we had in those days, the air gunner at the back, at the ship. And I said, well, I mean, I shouted down the Gosport tubing, but... I could only shout to the observer, I couldn't shout to the air gunner, to stop firing. Well, it, we, we just stood there trans, transfixed. It, 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 we just couldn't believe it. We would, uh, I mean, we weren't even told to close up, although we were near the gun. I mean, the captain just gave the order not to open fire. So um, uh, we just sort of stood around the gun in the in amazement to see what was what was really happening the next thing that was later on in the evening the aircraft came back again and they were told to find us first because uh, when they left the outlaw in the first case they said that there was no no other warship in that vicinity so when i mean the, the leader thought well there's only one thing but when you think that they, they'd been with us all that time and we had two funnels and the Bismarck only had one and uh, I mean we were only a quarter of the length of the Bismarck but I suppose they they, they were so bored up that here here's a ship you know it's got to be and so they just let rip well I mean um, uh in in the Merc, you see, I mean, we we were we were coming down. We were we were a very junior part of this attack, so the aircraft were out in front of us. And um, I mean, th th we're talking about you know fifty foot waves, and uh, and and well, I mean, the fact that we weren't even expecting it to be Sheffield. Nobody. So what our, what Bismarck looked like and Sheffield. But, you know, in, in the heat of the moment. But, of course, um, I mean, I, I tell you that um, going down from 10,000 feet and pulling out is quite, quite an excitement. So that, um, uh, I mean, I, w I wasn't in a, in a position to say, for God's sake, don't, because I, I didn't really take it in. And so a large number um, dropped their s torpedoes. Now, there's conflicting stories of why the torpedoes didn't hit us. Some said that the pistols on the torpedoes malfunctioned or that they were set for battleship depth and me, us being a cruiser, they went underneath. But it was a hectic quarter of an hour. There were 14 of them all together and it was only the last two that really decided that we were the Sheffield and not the Bismarck and uh, these torpedoes were exploding and, and going all, all over the place but the captain kept his head and he managed to steer us out of it. We were almost pleased we hadn't hit her. I mean, there, I think there are ten torpedoes were dropped. I think three of 
the crew held their torpedoes and didn't drop them. And I was one of them. The Godfrey Fawcett then led away, climbing up, away from the ship, and I was being left further and further behind because I had my torpedo on and he hadn't. And of course we were both, all of us, using full boost and full throttle. So I fired my front gun, the Swordfish had a single front gun, I fired my Vickers ahead of and he looked back and slowed down and I caught up with him and formated on him and then he said, drop it. You know, so I dropped my torpedo from about 6,000 feet <laughs> because we couldn't land on with it, you see. The sea was too, too rough to, to risk landing on with a live torpedo. We all landed on safely. Um, then we went and had a cup of tea. We rearmed and refueled and then we were off again, about five o'clock, I suppose, something like that. Oh, well, with tremendous uh, commendable, the captain of the Sheffield, a man of great resolution and intelligence, ordered his guns to stay silent. Even if they did get torpedoed, there's no point in shooting down the swordfish. Of course, they attacked the swordfish, and by the grace of God, once again, British ingenuity failed. Their torpedoes that they had got on all were armed with magnetic. With the result, they were set to, to run below the known draft of the Bismarck, which was, say, 50, 30, 30 foot and so uh, they were dropped to go run at about 35. So they all ran underneath the Sheffield, who's presumably been de or something by that time. Anyway, they failed to explode. Otherwise, tragedy was missed by such hairbreadth. And we weren't amused, nor was anybody else. The swordfish came back and said, my God, they realized their er error, because when they got closer to the ship, it's all very well at a range of about three miles, and the visibility is only three and a half miles. You, you don't see very much. You've got to drop your torpedo at half a mile or something, and as you're getting closer and closer, you're not looking to see whether it's got uh, iron swastikas all over it or Union Jacks. It, it's, a sh it's a target. And you go in there, and... It, well, you drop your torpedo and you think, my God, thank God I'm alive still. Uh, so the, you can't blame the air crew for this sort of thing. They all landed back. Of course, they learned with the realization that they had attacked the wrong ship. But that didn't stop them. I mean, they battled too. So did the entire ship. They, were, they battled too and rearmed with torpedoes with, with contact heads this time to, to launch a second strike. Well, they had to do it because it's getting dark. which, uh, with hindsight, uh, was, was a dummy run for the, the actual event, because we had to go back and change the head from, um, or at least the, the, the pistol, from a duplex to the, the big whiskers, which were, I suppose, were 12 inches. The whiskers. The torpedo had a, had, had an enormous... The duplex head was a little tiny thing about that size. It, it, would, it would contact or it would be go underneath and blow up magnetically. Hence, duplex. But the, the normal torpedo um, would be... Um, uh, had striked the actual ship. So these, these were the best answer... But in fact, of course, if, if, they, if they're in a sea condition which is unacceptable, they, they don't work. They blow up before they get there. That's the duplex. And the other time? She had to actually make contact, hence these large whiskers. I didn't have an observer. The leaders had observers but the numbers two and three didn't have observers, they just had air gunners. And it was rather a question of, you know, you don't want to waste too many aircrew if you lose, lose an aircraft. 
But after that, and when we got back to the ship, and some of the some of the aircraft didn't have observers, had they not, as it were, connected up with their leader who had an observer, he'd have had a job to get back to the ship. Because he'd got to do his own navigation, and there was no VHF homing in those days. And the um, beacon that the ship had could only be worked by the observer, couldn't be worked by the pilot, because it was in the after cockpit. So that the next strike we did, we had observers. Yes, if you, if you, if you arrived over the round down when, when, when it was on a rise and you were committed to the landing, you and the aircraft could come and meet at a great greater pace than was acceptable and it would drive the undercarriage up through the main plane and that's really the crux of this so there were a lot of planes damaged so that on the second strike which was uh, relatively successful uh, there, there, were, there weren't that number the, se the, second, the second wave um, went off and I didn't go with this because um, uh, by this time, the, the aircraft was U.S., and so I, I, I didn't participate. And after five and a half hours, um, the position of our own base, the Ark Royal, was getting a bit obscure because I mean the, she was nowhere near where she uh, where she uh, would have been if we just continued her PIM position and intended movement. Plot, um, so we'd no no idea where to re go to re get back to her, other than possibly picking her up on our radio beacon. But at that moment, when I was beginning to, you know, we were having to get back on board um, because fuel was beginning to get low, even with a long-range tank. Um, I heard my colleague Mitchman McWilliam ask for a bearing. You normally were only allowed to break wireless silence for enemy reports, but of course that was no longer in effect now we would found the enemy. And um, I heard the ship come back with a bearing, uh, and at that precise moment, by pure coincidence and all that weather and sky, McWilliam flew across our stern. <laughs> so we just turned to his, uh, the course that we'd been, been, he'd been given and came back on board. After five hours, 35 minutes in the air, with petrol fumes blowing in your ears for all that time, and was, one was so incredibly mentally flagged, flogged, with sort of exhaustion of sort of keeping tab of things. <laughs> one must have been a zombie for the next three hours. <laughs> as, I, as we landed, uh, there were a lot of people in the corridor to the to the crew room and the operations room where I had to go to report and I said what's up and I uh, saw my normal pilot Godfrey Fawcett and he said they were taking off for the strike and he said I said I'll have to come and join you and he said N don't do that you've had enough and I've got so and so and quite honestly I, let, I didn't <laughs> so I don't think I would have been much use <laughs>